Hi everyone and welcome to Chrysalis on the Couch. I'm Joanna Williams and I'm a tutor for Chrysalis. I teach year one. Um, like and subscribe our channel to see more of these videos and I uh, hope you enjoy, uh, enjoy what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm joined today by Mark, Susie and Viv and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves to you just now. Um, so Mark, over to you. Morning, my name is Mark Moore. I'm a year two student with Chrysalis, so I've done hypnotherapy in year one. Uh, I'm nearly coming towards the end of, of year two for, for counselling, and I'm based in Leicestershire. Brilliant, thank you. And Susie? Hi, I'm Susie. I'm a tutor for Chrysalis. I'm based in Leeds, um, and I'm um, a full time hypnotherapist. Brilliant, thank you. And um, Viv, over to you. Hi, I'm Viv Strettle. Um, I joined the Chrysalis course in, uh, for counselling in year two, having studied uh, NLP, hypnotherapy and life coaching in the past, and I'm based in Nottinghamshire. Brilliant. Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining me today and giving up your time. I uh, really appreciate you being on this virtual couch with me. Um, our subject for today is books that changed your life which I'm really excited about. There's a few places I'd rather be than sit on my couch talking about books. So I'm just delighted to have this topic. Um, I guess it came about when my colleague Jude did a, a webinar a few weeks ago, actually, about, um, about books. But it was more about kind of, um, I suppose, self-help type books, psychotherapy books that are really influential for her, that she found really helpful and interesting. And so we'd been talking about books generally, and how they can have such an impact, both that kind of non-fiction text, but also maybe fiction or, or different kind of books. And so we became interested in, interested in this topic of how they might um, change your life, even be transformative, or certainly influence you in some way. And I knew that tutors and students of Chrysalis would have something to say on this topic, so I'm really excited to hear about people's book choices today. Um, we've all had to think about it beforehand, I think, and come with some ideas of books. And we've all found it quite difficult from what we've chatted about before uh, to whittle it down to a few. So um, I guess I, like I say, I could talk for hours on this topic, so I won't. I'll shut up and go over to you guys. Um, so I'd really like one of you to just start us off, really, and just choose, choose one of your books and tell us, tell us a bit about it. Who'd like to go first? Well, I don't mind going first. Very please. Yeah, yeah tell us okay. Right, so the one I have chosen today is uh, Richard Carlson's Don't Sweat the Small Stuff and It's All Small Stuff, which is the sort of secondary title to that. And it's well over 20 years ago, actually, from, um, since I first read this book. And I think uh, I do credit this book with having changed my life com completely. And... I think, as with a lot of books, it's not always what's on the page. It's something that happens in your head when you're reading the book that does it. And I, and I think this, um, this changed me from being a very grumpy mum and wife, I think. I hope into it, hopefully a nicer person with my kids. Um, it just enabled me to see things in a different light. As I say, not sweating the small stuff not taking certain things so seriously and finding different meaning in the things that happened in my life. And I would recommend it for everybody because apart from it being a relatively small book, all of the chapters are sort of one or two page. Oh, there's money in there. Didn't know about that. Oh, even better. <laughs> <laughs> That's my kind of book. <laughs> so, you know, one or two or perhaps three pages maximum per chapter. Yeah. And so there's something, you know, you can get from that page and take away. And um, for example, from this book, I no longer stress about traffic jams uh, ever uh, if I'm on the road or being, you know, late because of traffic, because it's, it's small stuff. I can't do anything about it. And everybody's in the same boat. And I just see it as an opportunity to do something else, to listen to music, to listen to books. Yeah. to to think about things it's an opportunity for other things uh, you know the same the same when i'm in uh, airports you know i don't stress about them being late or anything it, out of my control and gives me the chance to do something else and and as i say this was the catalyst for that amazing 
Thank you. That's a brilliant selling job. I'm writing it down. I have heard of this book. <laughs> I've never read it. So, and I love small chapters too. I love yes. like short bits that I can yeah. jump into. Yeah. It really appeals. So that really changed your, like your personal. It did. Well I, think, on I, I think one of the silly things was it, it has a chapter that talks about, um, for example, if, if an ornament gets broken or a glass gets broken in the house mm. as a mum, you know, you can very often, oh, you know, you get upset because things get broken or because kids break things or whatever. And it was just a very sort of Buddhist type of view of, of the glass, of seeing the glass is already broken because it will be one day. You know, it's just part of its journey. Um, and I no longer got stressed about the kids breaking things. You know, it, it wasn't a golden ticket for them to go around, you know, with a baseball bat. But <laughs> it was... <laughs> but. It was a case of, well, you know, it was an accident and, you know, it doesn't matter in the scheme of things. And there are, there are much more important things in life than, you know, a piece, a piece of broken, you know, a, a broken possession, really. And while it's, as I say, it's small things, it just makes something go off in your head that says, you know, I should look at things differently. And I think that that was the biggest catalyst. And I, that was my journey into studying um, changing my life and life coaching and everything else. If I didn't know it then, but that was my, that was the start of my journey. Amazing, thank you. What a brilliant book to kick us off. <laughs> That's a perfect example, it really is. Has anybody else read that book apart from no, I will do now. <laughs> I'm write it down. <laughs> <laughs> totally sold, are you? It sounds amazing. Good, good. And we all need that, don't we? Like we need those reminders yeah. as well that it's the big stuff, isn't it, that we need, mm. to, uh, we need to be thinking yeah. about. And how often do we say that with our clients and our volunteers and um, mm. about perspective, but bringing it to ourselves? That sounds really, really good. So I think I might be getting that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, great. So that kind of set you on a path in terms of your yes. career yes. as well. But as you say, you perhaps didn't know it at the time. Um, so I guess Susie or Mark, was, were there any of your book choices that you think, oh, that was maybe the beginning of something for me? Well, I was just thinking, well, as I was listening to you, Viv, I was just thinking about how I kind of went through a, a sort of similar thing with um, maybe being quite grumpy and um, a bit sort of, I guess, sweating the, the small stuff a lot. And, um, it sort of relates to to a lot of books that I started to read, which were it sounds like they might be along kind of similar lines about um that kind of Buddhist view of being more in the present and not um sort of attaching a lot of stress to um little things, you know, the the traffic jam where well, it's just an opportunity to to do think of something else or to, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. So there's no point being stressed about it. Um, but I guess it was making me think about my children in particular. And one of the books that I've got is a children's book, which is called um, The Soul Bird, um, which is by Michael Schnuist, I think. Um, and I, I'm like evangelical about this book. I think every person should read it. Um, and so it kind of comes from a different point of view from sort of understand, well, it helped me to understand myself a bit, but also kind of understand a little bit about where my kids and kids are coming from. Um, and the book is about the, the soul bird um, who lives inside all of us. Um, and I'll, I'll show you, I mean, I won't spoil it, but um, the soul bird sometimes feel sad, um, sometimes feel happy, you know, sometimes feel um you know like they're just they're angry and they want to kind of hide away and it, it's very simple um but within it sort of talks about how we've got all these feelings inside of us and it describes them as drawers yeah. um and these drawers open and close at different times and sometimes they open at an appropriate time so we might feel angry but sometimes it's not appropriate or it's not what we want to be feeling um and it, I mean, I find it hard to read without it. It kind of really fills me with emotion, which is why I kind of brought it. Um, and when I've shared it with people, I once um, was in a class with 
counselling students, so one of, I brought it in, one of the students read it, and the whole class was kind of, this is a children's book, by the way, just blown away wow. by the message of the book. Um, so it's, it's just about, like, the kind of end of the book is about just being quiet and listening to what's going on inside you and listening to those emotions. So it kind of goes along with the sort of mindfulness idea of, you know, just pausing and actually taking time to listen to yourself. Um, but put in a way that adults and children can really relate to. So um, I work a lot with children to so kind of use this book and I use it with my own children. Obviously I've shared it with adults and here I am promoting it <laughs> to everybody. But it's just a really, really beautiful, beautiful book. Um, and I'm a good well. It sounds gorgeous. I can't believe I haven't come across that before either. It sounds really powerful. Well, it was a, some, I met a lady who was a drama therapist and um, I don't even know how we ended up talking about it, but she recommended it. And I, have, I don't think many people have read it. I think it, I don't know when it was, I don't know when it was first published, but um, it's, um, I don't think it's a sort of new, new book. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't actually say when it was published, um, but, um, but you can get it on Amazon. It's really, really great. Thank you. I think children's books sometimes can give us so much more, actually, in a way, can't they? Especially, actually, especially picture books. I was really interested in the illustrations there because they're really simple but really effective. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes picture books, um, you know, children sort of grow out of them, don't they? But they're so influential and they often have really powerful messages as well, especially about values and maybe about emotions, as you say. Mm -hmm. and, and that it does as good as adults to relate to them, I think. And, um, yeah, I mean, my children are forever saying to me, you know, why are you crying? You know, the end of Charlotte's Web or something. Oh, like no. That. <laughs> <laughs> they are, no. Nothing's affecting them, but I don't. I can't read it now. <laughs> so, so, I cried so much at the end of the first Harry Potter book, which we read together. We read the beautiful illustrated version, which is amazing. And um, I won't do spoilers, but there's a conversation that Dumbledore has with Harry at the end, and I was wrecked. And my son literally was, who was he, eight or nine at the time, was literally like, Mum, pull yourself together. <laughs> like, what is the matter with you? <laughs> he just looked at me and shook his head in despair. Yeah. <laughs> really ugly crying. It's dreadful. <laughs> I can but, definitely relate to that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, just get you don't they all the time and the thing is with books especially even more than films I can quite often be reading a book and think no it's not gonna get me you know people have told me oh it's a tear it's a tear joker and I'll be like no I'm fine and then just all of a sudden I'll just sort of go <laughs> that was quite a lot on trains and in public places and I'm reading as well which is always a bit, <laughs> a bit embarrassing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I need to be on my own probably when I read that so I need to <laughs> yeah <laughs> Like one that's it, 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 I, I mean, it certainly, I've, I, I have been, been in a room where it's read to other people and kind of seen the effect it had on them. I sort of think, well, maybe it's, <laughs> it's not just me not being, <laughs> being over emotional. <laughs> it's always a worry, isn't it? Other people read it, they're just like, <laughs> it's obviously not just you. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Oh, thank you for sharing that. What a, what a contrast, but also like some similarities as well. It sounds like it changed the way you related as well as a person. Yeah, I think just kind of thinking about, um, you know, where, where a child's emotion is, is coming from, but also, you know, in, in your moment of, for example, the, the, the broken glass, you know, your irritation, how is that going to affect the child and where's that coming from and what's that really, you know, about? Is it about the glass or is it about the 20 other? stressful things that have kind of happened to you yeah just so, behind that emotion yeah um so I, it was a useful and just really lovely lovely book. i mean I, I guess to just be able to share it with with your children is just a really nice thing as well so i'm on the list it's getting expensive this <laughs> like this uh, <laughs> webinar because it's on the couch i'm already racking up some book orders so i think i might be going to the library 
Um, and Mark, can you tell, because through one of yours, I'll let you choose which one you'd like okay. to talk about. Um, I think it's on the extremes, I've got one that's a fairly recent change for me and one back on sort of school age. Um, the recent one, it may sound like an unashamed plug for, for, for Chrysalis, so I, I apologise, but as all the students will probably be aware, we, we, we get a reading list, and, and like a lot of students, I'm sort of flicking through with hypnotherapy, and each book seemed to start the same. It was Anton Mesmer, and I'm thinking, and I just kept flicking through the first couple of chapters of the history, and then I found hypnotherapy, Dave Elman. Oh, Dave Elman. And that was my light bulb moment. I read it, and I read it again. And I read it again. I gave it a friend and we read it again. And just this sense of, if this is real, my sense of, you know, how slight it might be, but the potential help that, that hypnotherapy could be. And this, with my tutor's guidance and support, sort of, you know, just trying to push my own abilities and practices. And can we try this? Can we try and levitation and different inductions? And I just, I just got hooked. And it just totally, and I, and I joined the course, like a lot of people, the three-year course, thinking, I get through this and I can then just move on and focus on counselling, which I think there are a lot of people sort of focusing towards. And this did just stop me in my tracks. It was this real sense of, I think, you know, I remember saying to a lot of people, read this book first before the others. If this doesn't hook you in and just show you the power of hypnotherapy and maybe how it works. And that led me on to do some sort of clinical training as well. And I met some wonderful people. And, but also just to see it start to work. And I think it is a confidence thing with, with hypnotherapy, with you and your clients to you know, feel confident that you know what you're doing. Yeah. This book just did it all for me. Uh, you know, the point of, yes, I'm still pursuing counselling and I want to do it, I'm looking at placements, et cetera. But my passion for hypnotherapy just, yeah, that sort of overrides everything at the moment. So, yeah, and it was just, yeah, and just there's so many good examples in there as well. It's that sense of just sort of talking about the history of, I think it's a lot of the books do. Yeah, well, it's going to start yeah. with the past, yeah, rather than what it can do. Case studies. Yeah, and just bring it into the current context as well. Yeah, it was, just, it was a real, it, to me, it's like, it like my Bible sort of thing. That's my go-to book. Yeah. Amazing. I have to say, as a year one tutor, that's really good knowledge. That's like, really good insight for me as well, to be able to, like, to understand that that had such a powerful effect on you, to be able to guide my students to say, actually, of the reading list, maybe you want to go to this one, especially for those students who perhaps come along. And I count myself in this. I started training yeah. in 2013. And I was one who put their hands up and said, well, I'm really just here to do counselling. I'm not sure about hypnotherapy um, and did get hooked. But I do empathise with, with students who find themselves in that position at the beginning of year one. So that's really helpful to know that that was the book that for you sort of pulled you in because, um, you know, I think that is so important, isn't it, is to get that. Yeah, it's like, it gets that hook at the beginning. So cause I literally remember sort of skimming through five or six, and it's just this repetition of the history. And I'm thinking, yeah, I know that. I pick another book up. Yeah, I read that. And I eventually picked that one up. I thought, and it was scant regard to what's happened in the past. This is what we're doing with hypnotherapy now in, in sort of modern context, et cetera. And yeah, and I just thought, wow, couldn't put it. And also, but again, I mean, I think the, the relationship with the tutor as well at the time, so I talked about the book with her uh, and, and she read it as well. Uh, and it was just such an authoritative sort of guide and just, just created so many ideas and sort of showed the possibilities of uh, and gave me the confidence as well. Just going to go out there and practice more. Yeah, wonderful. Brilliant. And it has actually changed your life because now you're a practising hypnotherapist. As I yes. Yeah. Yeah. As I say, it's still my go-to yes. book. Yeah. Whenever the client comes with, I will generally go with yeah, I'll just look at Dave Elman first, kind of reference anything in there. But it's interesting just to pick up on, on what you, you and, Sal and Susie were saying earlier about sort of the power of words. How just, because when we talk about hypnotherapy, the way we sort of suspend reality, we get lost in a book. Um, but that's just like words so emotive. A, a, a client actually sent me a text today just describing life as a, a railway journey and we're a passenger on the train and people get on and off. And they sort of, yeah, so the seat by is empty and eventually will get off. And I sent it to my sister who then just phoned me up in floods of tears and just said, oh, it's so beautiful. And two minutes later, my wife phoned me up and said, oh, it's... And she, and I thought, okay, <laughs> but just the power of words, how we just lose ourselves, and it just triggers our imagination so much better. Yeah. It is Dave Elman, sorry. 
I was say, Dave, Dave Elman was the, was the, I guess, one of the guys we studied on the, the hypnotherapy course I did uh-huh. many years ago. And my, my teacher was taught, I think, by Dave Elman. And she was, uh, she's, yeah, she's quite, it wasn't in this country. And um, she's, uh, you know, we used to do the Elman induction as yes. our, that's our induction. That's, that's the, main, the main induction. And yes, it is, you know, it, um, and, and I think the great thing, as you say, about hypnotherapy is the fact that it's, it, you know, we are in waking hypnosis all the time. You know, we are, we are being hypnotized all the time by different words. When we suspend belief, when we watch a film, when we get in, absorbed in anything, you know, we are in hypnosis effectively, although we don't realize it. And as you say, the power of words and, and what they do to us. Um, some, and, and I guess when we're reading a book, in a, in a sense, we are hypnotized by that book. We are taken into that book. We, we suspend the world, you know, outside. I mean, when you're reading Harry Potter, you know, you kind of know that, yes, that's a different world. It's not the world we are living in necessarily, um, but you're prepared to fully believe it and fully be immersed by it and fully affected by what's going on in a world that may or may, may not be real. And I, and I think that, as you say, is the great thing with hypnosis and, and is, is that it, it just takes, you know, it does take you away to that sort of uh, another place, but whilst, you know, not going anywhere. Yeah, it does. And that's, um, that's what, what books do, isn't it? They do, they transport you. Yeah. Like I say, without having to leave your sofa, you can be somewhere different. Yeah. I think we, we lose... I think we're losing to some degree the art of, because you think culturally for, for millions of years, we've passed on traditions and everything else with storytelling, uh, yeah, from generation to generation. And, and these days we don't do, you know, we use images, we use TV, et cetera, media, but for thousands of years, it's also been the spoken word uh, that we passed on traditions, knowledge, et cetera. Uh, and it's just that, yeah, it's much more, it evokes our imagination much more. We, we create our own pictures, right? not, not with books, we create our own characters. Yeah. And this kind of memory, there's a lot of times I've read a book and then gone to see the film and just think, you know, the characters were just not what I did. Yeah. Right. The characters I created weren't there. Yeah, it's so weird, isn't it? I do wonder sometimes whether, um, yeah, as you say, whether we're losing that. I mean, I think, and I do think as therapists, though, we are interested in stories, aren't we? Naturally, that's, that must be in us because whether it's hypnotherapy or counselling, talking therapy, that's what we want, isn't it? We want to hear people's stories. We want to make some connection with them through that story. So I think it comes from a similar place, really. It doesn't really surprise me that lots of therapists like books, <laughs> <laughs> like words. You know, we, we kind of like that, don't we? We're, we're interested in that. And, um, yeah. And there's, yeah, and I have the best interest as a writer. I write as well. So as a writer, I'm really interested in the power of words and, the idea that you can transport somebody or if not transform their life certainly influence them even for a short time there's something really magical in that so um so books have literally changed my life like just the whole existence of books and the world of books have been uh, have been the biggest influence probably in my entire life um I did an english degree i did um a master's in creative writing i write partly what i do now is write for a living so I'm all about the words. Um, and when I started to train as a therapist, I do remember saying to somebody, it comes from, so I had a big career change in my 30s from sales to, to doing this and to, and to taking my writing more seriously. And I remember saying to somebody, you know, my goal is to be a writer and a therapist. And that those two things come from the same place, from that same impulse of being really interested in people, actually. Just find people really fascinating, people's stories. As you say, well, can that history of storytelling and how we... How we connect with each other through stories. I'm just fascinated by that. And I think that speaks to both books and, and therapy. Um, so I have loads of books that have changed my life. I'm trying to think if I, which one I should choose um, to talk about. I'm going to, actually, I'm going to choose one that might then lead into one that I think Susie's got. Um, so I'm going to choose one that is actually fiction, but also has relevance to my... Um, professional life so kind of uh, well fiction has relevance to my professional life but to my counselling life um, because uh, primarily outside of my chrysalis work I do um, bereavement counselling chiefly and has anybody read this little beauty grief is the thing with feathers it's another little book very little <laughs> I've got 
I think as I get older, I've got a shorter attention span, so I quite like small books. Um, by Max Porter, it came out a few years ago, and this is, uh, of all the books that I sort of pulled out, this is probably the most recent that I've read. Uh, I think I read it last year, and it absolutely blew me away. It is a tiny, strange, unusual little book. It's not like anything else I've ever read. It's very poetic. Um, it's funny, but also desperately sad. And it's basically the story of um, a man and his two boys. Uh, he's, their mum has died recently, suddenly. And it's basically dad and the boys. And they're visited by this crow character who takes them through their sort of grief journey, which sounds peculiar. It is a bit peculiar, but it sort of works. Um, the, the dad is a sort of shambolic Ted Hughes scholar. The boys are just are little boys, lovely little boys. And um, they're all desperately sort of getting through this, uh, this experience. And it, it alternates between dad, crow, boys, it's all different voices. And you can see it's laid out almost like poetry as well, but it does tell a narrative. And it just, it just bowled me over. Like, absolutely bowled me over because I read a lot. <laughs> I'm a very, very voracious reader. Um, I've read a lot of fiction, non-fiction, poetry, everything I can get my hands on, but I've never read anything quite like this. And I, because I work with grief more or less every day, um, and I've read, so I've read a lot of textbooks on grief and loss, as we probably all have as we start, as we study these subjects and, and, and work in therapy. And nothing has articulated grief for me as effectively as this book, this little book. It's so beautiful. And I was actually astonished to read, I couldn't believe that Max Porter hadn't been through this experience himself. It's so visceral and real. Uh, I mean, he's, he's been bereaved, I think he lost his dad, but he, it just, I couldn't believe he wasn't a bereaved, uh, sort of a widower, a bereaved parent, because it's just so well articulated. Um, so yeah, I can't, I don't know what else, to, I may read you a little bit that makes me, that, that brings that to life really. I can't explain how, there's a bit where he talks about his, wife and it's so lovely do i need tissues I yeah you know. might it's really gorgeous i don't know if i'll be able to find it now i should have prepared this beforehand um and i'll read that out and then i'll leave it because okay here we go uh i'm just gonna check there's no bad language in it yeah, so this is, okay, so I'm going to read, I mean, indulge me for a minute, I'm going to read this to you just to give you an example. This isn't a sort of poetic, but it's a little paragraph of prose, but it's really beautiful. And this is the dad remembering uh, his wife. She had flu. It was unusual for her to be ill. The boys were tiny and it, it had snowed and she couldn't bear us rampaging about the house. So we got dressed and went sledging in the park. We were pathetic without her. The boys didn't know where their hats were, couldn't get their joined mittens through their puffer jackets didn't want to see other boys, bigger boys, sledging on the hill. I was hopeless. I took them out without wellies, so before we'd even got down the road, their little toes were aching. They both whinged, and we all felt, the three of us, that without her, things didn't work as they should. They pitied me. I felt acutely embarrassed that my brilliance as a father had been exposed as wholly reliant upon her. Perhaps if I'd known it was a dress rehearsal for the rest of our lives, I would have said, buck up, you little turds, or help me or take me, take me instead, please. So that's, grief is the thing with feathers. <laughs> and it just, yeah, the whole thing is so gorgeous. So I would really recommend it. And um, it's, it's stunning, yeah, it's stunning. So yeah, that made me realize that I still had a lot to learn about grief so, uh, yeah sorry I've stunned everybody into silence now with that little reading from Max Porter he's such a great writer really yeah. really great writer so I do really recommend it. there's no way to follow that really so. no it's like, it's like broken us all a little bit there I know really sad isn't it really really it's just peppered yeah. like that and, you, and then there'll be bits that are actually really funny and bits that are really quirky because this sort of big crow character comes into the flat and you're like what's going on here this is wacky and it's a sort of metaphor I suppose for mm. what they're going through but it blows you away it's just 
And it does end on a sort of note of hope. It does end really in a really beautiful way as well. So, so. I think to write about the actual like physical pain of grief yeah. um, is really powerful. And because I, I work um, with bereavement as well, and a hospice, and um, people just aren't prepared for the actual physical nature of grief. And so, you know, I think that to be able to kind of, I don't know whether it's all right to mention my book, but the yeah. kind of this book, The Language of Loss by... Loss of the New Wood, yeah. Okay. Um, is she's writing about where there aren't words sometimes for what you feel. Um, she lost, she was, she's a psychotherapist. Um, and she has a sort of background in television and writing. And her husband, Bill, um, died very suddenly, had a aortic aneurysm which ruptured. And so um, they were perfectly fine one day, and then he was gone within days. And um, she, so she's written, I mean, I love any book that's a kind of autobiography anyway. I always, always want to read, you know, some people don't think it's you. Um, but she's talking about his death and her like first year after he died. Um, so it's very she's like writing it as as she's going through it. And but within that book, she talks about different kinds of theories around grief. So um, the sort of tasks of grief and a bit about like Kubler Ross's stages and. Um, the kind of oscillation theory where people need yeah, dual, dual process. Um, but what she's really saying is it's unique and that you know those theories are all very well and sometimes she can relate to them and sometimes she can't um, and so it is really sad um, you know it makes you cry sometimes it makes you laugh and, but you can really and, and you can really feel what she, she's experiencing um, and she sort of says towards the end, actually, and they're not even not talking about it, just, you know, other things. Sometimes she didn't have the words to say what was, was happening to her. So it's, it's definitely, if you're working, well, I think for anybody anyway, because we're all going to experience grief and loss. But if you're working with people who are, are bereaved, it, yeah. it helps you to get out of the theories and into the actual yeah. what's happening to them into a real yeah. story and real experience yeah because actually the the theories are not, and probably not that helpful in a lot of cases um except to reassure you that some of the sim symptoms and feelings you're experiencing are not unusual I suppose, yeah. where they can be helpful but I mean, the, the beginning, she talks about kind of, you've got sort of this feeling that she's losing her mind, um, which is so frightening and which is actually not a normal, you know, the thing is normal, but is what so many people experience is that, uh, you know, it's just not, the whole world shattered. Um, and that, that, that's really helpful, I think, to sort of, uh, to, Maybe not as a bereaved person, it might be quite hard to read it, but yeah. at some stage, but like, to be yeah. able to sort of say, no, this is, this is what happens, you're not unusual. Yeah, so, and I think that those yeah. stories, those, gen those real stories for people can be very comforting, can't they? Perhaps, again, they say a bit later, because I was going to say, I wouldn't recommend this, somebody who's been bereaved in the last year, say, for example, not that there's a time limit, I think, but it's very raw, I wouldn't. I wouldn't sort of hand that to somebody who's just lost somebody um, special because it's very, it's, it'd be a tough read, I think. But I think in time, those stories can be a comfort, can't they, in a way? And I, and I imagine, I wonder if that was therapeutic for her, the act of writing as well, to mm. put that down on paper. So. I, think, I think it was, and she sort of didn't know what else to do, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was how she did it. It's a way of, of getting it out, isn't it? It made me wonder whether reading is sort of therapeutic as well. And we touched briefly, didn't we, about on how, um, you know, we can lose ourselves, be transported into other worlds when we read. And there's something um, 
you know, when I think about self-care and what are the things I need to do to look after myself, one of the best things I, I know I can do is sit for half an hour with a book. So there is something innately therapeutic about reading as well for lots of us, isn't there? And about writing, actually. Mm. Do you find that the, the, the subject matter, I know something I've been very acutely aware of through training, is the amount of self-awareness that just flourishes as you, and particularly with things like bereavement, it, it does create this need to go and start having those conversations yourself. So, yeah, all, all the various modules I've done, you, do, you just become self think, does this apply to me? And particularly with bereavement, because I've got, I'm, I'm the youngest of seven, yeah. so I've got uh, relatives in the sort of 70s, and so I think, well, actually, we need to have these conversations. You know, we don't like talking about things that aren't nice, but we have to start to generate those conversations. I think generation people are becoming just sort of a bit more open to it, rather than wait for the inevitable and it's what happened. But I think all the subjects that we cover do just create such self-awareness at least. You know, we do sort of look in with ourselves and think, is this, is this me? Am I doing this? Yeah, definitely. Once it's out of the box, you kind of, it's there, isn't it? You have, <laughs> you have to look at it, you can't put it back in. and. And we do, don't we? We try and sort of bring our families and friends along with us and maybe start those conversations that are difficult. And I think with, with death and, and dying, we probably should be having those conversations, actually. Um, and maybe books are a nice way to do it. Maybe introducing books is a good way. Um, so, yeah, I did realise that half the books I'd chosen were about death and dying, actually. So let's move on from, <laughs> from me and my maudlin selection. But I do find it interesting. Um, and because I work with that subject matter, I probably find it very easy to talk about compared to maybe some people. So I have to rein myself in sometimes. Um, in fact, I will tell you a funny thing. I was, sat, I was camping a couple of summers ago and I was reading Staring at the Sun, sitting in my little camping chair in the morning with my cup of tea uh, with some friends. And a friend came, what are you reading, Joe?" And I said, oh, I'm just reading a book about death anxiety. And she was like, you really know how to relax on holiday, don't you? And I was like, it's brilliant. It's really good. She was just like... It's brilliant. It, it, yeah. <laughs> mini plug there for staring at the sun which is highly yeah. recommended it's superb yeah that, that did uh not so much changed my life but it influenced the way i thought about about death for sure anything by urban yalom is definitely worth reading he's brilliant yeah. isn't he? he's brilliant. yeah has anybody else got any urban yalom on their list of today cool. got what sorry early yeah. yalom this chap any of his books, any of his books. The Gift of Therapy is also a really good, it's not, so Staring at the Sun is obviously more to do with his work with kind of death and yeah. existence yeah. And, and all of it obviously has an existential yeah. theme to it, but as a kind of introduction, I think um, The Gift of Therapy is yeah. really, but I mean, not even, it's like anybody to read, not even just the therapist, he's just talking about his different cases and, and he, he is a writer as well, so he writes really beautifully and it's very easy to, to read. And so he's just kind of, it's the way he writes about the relationship that he has with his, with his clients that really is so powerful. So, and they are so accessible, aren't they, his books? I think they are very readable, very accessible, but also like quite, quite profound at the same time, which is quite a skill, isn't it? He's a very skilled writer. Um, has anybody got anything that isn't about death? Anybody got a different Yes. Go on. <laughs> well, it's about life and purpose. I, actually, to, oh. um, the, the, the second book I've got here, um, it's a while since I've read it, and so I can't necessarily remember what was in the book, and I think that's interesting about books sometimes, is that they, you don't always remember what was on the page. You just remember what the book did to you. Yes, and you do remember the, the changes that it made. And this one is A New Earth Eckhart. by Eckhart Tolle. Yeah. Um, and um, again, again, I wasn't in this, this country when I was uh, living outside the country when, when, when I read this. And I think in terms of how it changed my life, I think it was another of the books that changed me as a person. Yeah. And I think enabled me was, again, it was another step on my journey to counseling but i had no idea at the time i think what i can say about it is that it opened me up to the experience of i guess the world in a way and and looking at other people i think you know whereas the first book had opened up and changed me in terms of how i was interacting with my own family and my children and and how i was behaving in that sense 
this one made me look at how I was interacting with the rest of the world and people, I guess, around the world. I was living in Dubai at the time, so we were kind of, kind of obviously being immersed in a different culture and a different world and everything else. But also it did make me think about other people. It made me think about people outside my own close sort of, you know, the family and connections. Yeah. And it, so to me, it was, uh, it, that was, it was a new awakening. It is about an awakening. It's about awakening to your life's purpose, Ooh. which is what a lot of his books are. His, his first book, or well, his first most commonly known book is called The Power of Now, which yeah. is also one of my favorite books. It's a little bit heavier to read than this one. And I think you could get most of it from reading this one, to be honest. And it's about the, the, the idea, and well, this is about the same, that there isn't really any past, there isn't any future, there is only now. Only now actually exists, only this moment actually exists. Yes, the past was there, but there's nothing you can do about that except learn from it. The future is there, there's nothing you can do about that except plan for it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't live in the past and you can't live in the future, you can only live now. Yeah. And understanding that is, is part of the theme. But as I say, you wouldn't think that this was a book about humanity from its title necessarily. Or, but as I say, sometimes it's not what's on the page. It's just something, something comes off the page to you that, that changes, changes you, changes the way you think, changes, you know, who, I think who you are as a person. and that sort. So I would certainly recommend it. And as I say, it's, it's not, although it's quite a big book, um, it's not a difficult read yeah. and um, you'll f it's quite different as you say to the, to the sort of subjects you've been looking at but uh, okay, but it is a, a, a wonderful look at I think possibilities and uh, yeah, energy yeah. And, and you know sort of how, how the world works so it's, I'd say it's probably one of the second as I say the second book that had that sort of effect on me and changed changed the direction of my life even though I didn't really know it at the time Brilliant. Thank you, Viv. And probably, like I say, maybe it was a sort of perfect storm as well, because it's where you're at in your life, it's where you're living, it's mm. all of those influences mean that that book has that effect on you at that time as well. Yeah. It? So it just, it, just grabs it you. Was, it was actually on Oprah's book list as well, apparently. I believe that's supposed to be quite an interesting thing. Yeah, that makes <laughs> <sense. Brilliant laughs> copies. <laughs> so it's a good thing. Not, not, not that it, not that it necessarily influenced my choice of books, but, but just to know that was. And he had, she had, um, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's quite difficult to listen to. If you listen to him talking, yeah, he's very dry. You know, it's quite difficult. I wouldn't recommend him as an audio book, perhaps <laughs> necessarily. I shouldn't really say that. No, no, I, I do know what you mean about the way he speaks. Yeah. Um, but but on the page, he you know he comes alive, and uh, you know his his sort of world and the world comes alive. I would say. Super. Thank you. This is a bit like Radio Four Book Club, isn't it? Or <laughs> fantastic. Doing so well. Um, we have to wrap up shortly, but I think uh, probably Mark, if you've got one more that you want to plug while you've got your time. <laughs> And it's a book that, well, 43 years ago, so I'm not going to quite give away my age, I was still at school then. Um, and this for me, it just changed the way I looked at books and reading. As a 14-year-old at school, um, I don't know if the terminology has changed now, but we were doing options, we got to pick home level subjects, etc. And I didn't, probably a classic teenager, I didn't want to do anything. And at the bottom of my options list was something called classical studies. And I thought, with a couple of friends, that looks a bit... It was Sky, it was Doddle, so we, we opted ah. for And prior to going up for our last two years and, and, and sort of O-level studies, the, the, the tutor was taking us, there was four of us from the whole school decided to do classical studies, and he gave us the, the Iliad. Iliad, wowzers. Uh, nearly 3,000 years old. Uh, yeah, Delta. Wars, and he just said, you need to read that during the summer holidays, which I thought was a bit hijacked by summer holidays. Um, and then you can tell me all about it just so to prove you read it when you come back to school uh, and just prove you really want to do the course. And after everything I've read, sort of, and I also felt force fed with literature because obviously there's a syllabus with English literature and English language, and you've got sort of it was Shakespeare, I think we did Lord of the Flies, I felt I've been told what to read. Yeah. And again, although I sort of came to this sort of, you've got to read it, but it just changed my view of, of stories and just got me hooked on classics and just. 
the choice of books out there. And, I, and the strange thing was, our second book was um, the Aeneid. The Aeneid, I, love, I prefer the Aeneid actually. Yeah. Really. And the tutor said, "There's an opera on at Nottingham," and I thought it, it took four 15-year-old lads to the opera, sort of comprehensive school. And I've loved opera from the minute I walked out of there. Um, and just my whole view of music, and we did architecture and art and everything. It just opened up a whole new vista of, you know, coming away from the 16-year-old sort of pop music and that sort of culture thing. There's a lot more out there. And just, just totally opened my eyes and just made me more aware of, yes, we've all got different tastes, but we can also just look at other things in a, in a new context and try other things as well. So, yeah, it, Changed my reading pattern for the rest of my life now. What a teacher that guy was. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Right. He, he taught me Russian as well, which, uh, it, and, and Latin. So. <laughs> it's, been, it's been really useful, not. <laughs> well, but still. So, the, so, let me get this right. You read the Iliad when you were, what, 14, 15? 14, yeah. <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> that's really, that's a biggie. Yeah. But the whole, but again, it gave me that interest in, in storytelling because yeah, there's still this, there's still this long debate. You know, were Homer and Virgil were they writing poetry? Was this a story, or was it based on historical fact around the Trojan Wars and Anne of Troy, all this kind of thing, with the foundation of Rome? So, yeah, then it would have been spoken. It was handed down yeah. kind of who spoken yeah. the oral storytelling tradition, which is. Um, Amazing, and they're just ripping yarns, aren't they? They're just fantastic <laughs> yarns. Those yeah. topics. They really are like Homer and Virgil stuff. I studied it at uni, and I found it like pretty mind-blowing stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> crikey, that sort of inspired me to go back to Homer now. So, thank you. <laughs> back to that. Go back to the classics. Awesome. Thanks, guys. That was absolutely brilliant and so varied. The texts that that we all chose, and um, and yet some like common threads and themes coming through. So, hopefully. Um, that's interesting for people to to look at. Oh, and can we say on YouTube that people could put in the comments maybe books that have changed their life? That'd be really nice to mm. uh, to see, actually, because I'm just always fascinated to hear um, about the books that have interested people. And thank you, because I've got some. Um, there's only a couple of those books that I already have, so I now need to go and order the others. So <laughs> thank you for the recommendations as well. Um, Thanks so much for taking part. Thanks for watching, everybody who's watched. Um, in the, again, a reminder to like and subscribe. If you can, the next um, Christmas on the Couch will be hosted by Lorna Cordwell and her theme is Salad Days. So that promises to be an interesting look at, um, should I give too much away? It's about youth and youthfulness. I think Salad Days tells you that much. So that'll be uh, an interesting chat, especially in sort of current contexts. So yeah, thanks ever so much. I am going to say goodbye now. So thanks, Mark, Viv, Susie give a wave and um, we'll say bye for now and see you next time.